My name is Aaron Dem, and I'm one of the producers on Transformers 1. When I first got uh, asked to join Transformers, uh, it was really exciting for me because one, the script was very compelling, and one of the things that I've been driving towards as an animation producer is really creating a movie that is epic in scale and has the visual complexity of a live action film, but using the animation medium uh, to bring, uh, to create a movie that's really for all audiences. This movie is for someone age eight all the way up to 88 because the, sub the, the story is complex, but it plays to all ages. From an animation perspective, we had to create robots that looked and moved like robots, but created faces and their mannerisms that had emotional um, connectivity to our audience, which are obviously humans. So we blended those together from a character standpoint and from a, uh, a world perspective. Uh, from minute one, Josh loved Art Deco as, as an inspiration. So we wanted to create Cybertron, and we created basically a Cybertron underneath the planet's surface and the surface that we wanted to be almost a tangible realism. So that way when we started, when the audience sees the movie, they feel like they can almost reach out and touch it. What makes our foursome unique is that they each bring really their own personality and sort of their drive. And, and each character also uh, has a fantastic arc. With Orion Pax, he's really the dreamer and he's really in search of trying to better his life. D16 is someone who really likes um, sort of where he is, is, is a huge fan of Sentinel Prime, takes tremendous pride in what he does. Um, Alita One also is like that and almost more of a drill sergeant. And then we meet uh, uh, B127, who is sort of this, almost like a puppy dog in a weird way, but evolves into this great warrior. Uh, and he's got great comedy, he definitely brings the comedic uh, beats to the movie. And Alita, down the road, becomes inspirational and uh, really motivates Orion when he's down uh, to really step up and really uh, motivates him to become the person that he needs to be, which is ultimately Optimus Prime. I'm really excited about bringing this movie in 3D because we've always wanted this movie to be large in scope and putting it into that third dimension really gives you another layer of immersion into our film. And when we first started, we were really happy with the movie in and of itself in 2D, because it was really exciting and funny and great action. I've been involved in 3D actually probably most of my career, and this is the best 3D project I've uh, been associated with. It really looks fantastic, and everybody should see it in 3D IMAX. Cybertron, as a planet also is almost a character in the movie. And we took a lot of care in building it because it's never been seen before. And the creation of it really started with what was in Josh's head, Art Deco. We could have gone with a planet that just looked metallic with a few different shades, but we really wanted to bring color and vibrancy to the film. And we hired Jason Shire, our production designer on the film, who I had met in the past and thought was tremendously talented. And Jason and his crew created the vision for what uh, Cybertron looked like. Icon City, Art Deco, tons of buildings. Megatron and Optimus's uh, history and as characters are, are universal because it's really good versus evil, right? And, and everybody loves that type of battle. What I think people aren't going to expect, which really makes this movie unique, is when you start the movie, they're both in a very similar place. They're best friends. And where they get to as arch enemies by the end of the movie is, is a journey that uh, is really enjoyable and heartbreaking and action-packed. And at the end of it, you really have compassion for both of them, but you also need to understand how, what drove them to sort of where they go. And that's the really interesting part of this movie is at the end, you, you hate and you love both of them because of the struggle they went through. 
And it's really an emotional journey that people are not going to expect. Josh Cooley, as a director and as a human being, is second to none. One, he could not be a nicer guy. He cares about everybody. He gives everybody the time they need. And as a director, he's unbelievably impressive. And everyone on our movie works so hard to give everything we possibly can because we want to do it for Josh and we want to do it for the movie. I am Brian Tyree Henry and I play D16 who becomes Megatron. It still doesn't truly feel like it happened uh, and that I'll be a part of the pantheon that is Transformers as one of the greatest, you know, arch nemesis of all time. Uh, but I was incredibly elated. My inner child was going insane, uh, still is. But, it, you know, you, you answer the call. It, it, it truly was, uh, you know, just one of those benchmarks in your career that you're like, oh, I really did that. Like, I'm really a part of that. So it, it still feels truly incredible, incredibly honored, too. That's always been my favorite thing about villains, actually, is like, you know, I don't believe any villains started completely evil or angry, like something made them who they were. And then they go on this charge to fulfill whatever destiny they think they have to. Um, but what I really like about this one is that it is truly the beginning. And we got all the humans out of the way. That's the thing with trans like, get, get the humans out of there. You know, humans complicate stuff. So like this one, we at least start on Cybertron where they originate, which is their home. We rarely get to see like where they come from. And, and, and also just to see the absolute beginning of Optimus and Megatron, like the, the fact that they were actually brothers, like really close brothers, best friends, um, and what unfolded and how they got to where they were. So the, the origin of, of all these Transformers uh, is what really appealed to me. D16, scrappy, smart, hard worker, uh, really likes to follow the rules, uh, a really loyal friend, a really great dude, a lot of heart, um, but, he isn't as precocious and inquisitive about why things are the way they are as, uh, you know, Orion Pax, uh, Optimus Prime. He, he truly is aspiring to be more, but he's not gonna, like, he's not gonna cross the line. He, he's about justice. He hates injustice. Um, and he's just really loyal. And, and what I love the most about playing D16 was to really find the heart of who he was, you know, to really find out, you know, what made him laugh, what made him, you know, what made him uh, fearful, all the things that truly you don't really get to see once he becomes Megatron. I really wanted to figure out, uh, get to the core, honestly, of who he was. The biggest thing you find out about D16 is that he truly is about fighting injustice. He really wants uh, to right the wrongs that have happened. He doesn't like being deceived. He doesn't like you know, feeling like he isn't worth anything. And I just wanted people to really care about that and to really follow his heart and to see that, you know, he is championing for things to be right. He doesn't like injustice. And, and I think that that's one of the best traits about him. You know, I think that's what we kind of want in our friends, right? We want somebody that's gonna be our protector, that'll have our back, that'll actually stand up for us. And that's D16 in a nutshell. It's crazy when you watch the film how much our personalities are really in these characters because I feel like Orion is Chris 100,000%. Um, you know, the precociousness, the, the like little deviant, you know, a little mischievous, but also truly just uh, a person that you want to follow, a person that you want to like tag along with. You know, all these little schemes that he comes up with. Uh, but a truly, truly good friend. To play with Chris, like, you know, like when, when you meet him, he's just absolutely the most approachable, loving, silly, goofiest person ever. And so when you put the two of us together in these two, you know, characters, you watch this friendship blossom, you root for this friendship, you want to see it um, become more uh, steeped in like loyalty and love rather than what we eventually know it becomes. We're seeing them on their home planet. We're seeing them on their home turf. We're seeing them where they originated. We're seeing them actually discovering who they are. I, the whole premise of this movie is them trying to figure out who they are um, in, on this planet. Uh, if they 
you know, they've been assigned certain destinies of, of what they're going to be and where, what charge they have to take and where they live and what they do and what job it is. And, you know, you watch them. Uh, it's, it's such a coming of age tale. And so you're watching, you know, Orion and D16 try to figure out who they are. Where you have D16 who's like, oh, yeah, that's what they told me I'm going to be. That's what I'm going to be. Where Orion is very much like there's got to be something more. And I think we all can relate to that. I think, you know, as we grow, these are the things that we're trying to figure out about ourselves. Where do we belong? Where do we fit? Who are the people that are gonna be by our side? Like, what, what does friendship truly mean? And so you meet all of these characters trying to figure all of that out. Josh's excitement is really contagious. And, and, and I love that when we want to go back to these stories that we've all held um, over time that we grew up with, you want somebody who truly cares about it. Somebody who you felt like sat right on the sofa with you Saturday morning eating a bowl of cereal. Uh, and that's who Josh is. His imagination is unlike anything that I've ever seen. You, you can't help but get excited. I hope that whatever notions that people walked into Transformers with, we completely changed their minds. I, I want people to truly care about Megatron to see that, you know, there was more to him to really hold the friendship that the four of these um, bots had very close to know that everything that we have been told isn't necessarily the truth of who these bots are and that you walk out with your heart like just incredibly full of just like, oh, you know, like that's that's where they started. That That's what was possible. Uh, and fun, because it's a funny movie. It's fun. It is absolutely fun. The adventure that they go on on this one is nonstop. Like it, 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 from the moment you sit down, it's, it's, it's off to the races. I think that this is a reminder of why we go to the movies, a movie like this. It's a reminder of why we, you know, come out of our homes and sit next to a bunch of strangers uh, to have this kind of joy, to have that kind of fun, and the nostalgia of it, um, and how we're just flipping it up in, on its head so you get to see the beginning. I mean, you can go to any country and say Transformers and they'll know exactly what it is. So I think that that is a testimony uh, and a testament to who they are, like, and, and what this story means to people and, and just how ahead of its time it was. The character I play is Orion Pax, who some may know is the individual who becomes Optimus Prime. Feels fantastic to be officially part of the Transformers franchise. Uh, I like Many of my friends grew up playing with Transformers, watching the cartoons, big fan of the films. So to be involved in the animation space is incredible. To be voicing Optimus Prime is, uh, is, is another level again. I think what intrigued me or drew me to the project was I hadn't been a part of an animation film before, so this was a new creative venture. Uh, but the fact that this was the origin story of uh, Optimus Prime, and for some people who may know that he begins as Orion Pax, as a uh, insignificant worker in the mines, and then this is the, the birth of a hero, really. And this is his journey to becoming the all-powerful, all-knowing Optimus Prime that we, that we love. Peter Cullen has voiced the character of Optimus Prime for over four decades now, and uh, it was certainly, uh, there was a huge amount of anxiety and trepidation coming into this. Um, big shoes to fill, for sure but I used everything that he had done as uh, inspiration and influence, and I feel honored to be alongside him now uh, to play this character. I've done a lot of action films uh, in the live action space, but this is the first time in the animation world, and I've got to say it actually takes a lot more physicality and effort than I first assumed. I thought I'd just be sitting in a chair reading lines, but um, for the action scenes in, in particular in our film, I was jumping around and having to throw punches and make noise and kind of, you know, exert a fair amount of energy to give uh, what was going to be heard on screen um, something very specific and something that had the same um, energy that, uh, that, that the character that you were seeing, the animation character, was, was also giving off. Yeah, there's many themes in this film that we're able to explore, um, a big one being friendship. It really is about their journey and their evolution as individuals and it's about friendship it's about personal growth it's about exploring one's path in life 
There's a great amount of comedic banter in the film, which was a lot of fun to explore. Uh, this is a film about two best friends. Uh, sadly, they become enemies, but up until, until that point, um, the, the, there was a lot of fun to be had. The first time I met Josh Cooley, uh, there was a great sense of, 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 of trust I had within his vision. He had such passion and enthusiasm for the world, a huge amount of knowledge and understanding, and you know there was gonna be epic visuals and the, the animation was gonna be fantastic, but at the heart of it, he wanted to get down to what the, the point of the story was that we were telling, which was about these um, two individuals, um, the journey of self-discovery, but about a friendship that unfortunately ends up in, in a space where the two of them become enemies. Um, but Josh's passion and, and detail and nuance was, was incredible and it was a lot of fun to work with him. So finding the voice for Orion Pax was a lot of fun. We wanted to honour the legacy of what Peter Cullen had done, but we did want to do something uh, different and unique and the character also uh, was a younger version of what we know as Optimus Prime. So it did have to have a different vocal quality and different rhythm to it. Um, and, and, and that was a really, really um, fun, creative journey to, to um, map that out. The film was unlike anything I've seen in the animation space. It was incredible. Visuals were stunning, um, action-packed. Uh, the, the colours, the tones, the detail, uh, again, just felt fresh and unique and exciting. My name is Josh Cooley, and I'm the director of Transformers 1. We looked at the original designs from G1 back in the, you know, the first Transformers generation, and, which I love watching growing up, and, and so we started there. And we're, we're, when we were designing the characters into 3D, uh, the thing that was important to me was that it felt believable. We weren't going for super realistic, uh, like the live action ones, which have to feel that way because you're, you're in a real world. Uh, we have an opportunity to do something totally different with this film. Being um, on Cybertron, which is all made of metal, and in space, no humans, so it felt it, just, it, it needed to have something that just felt different from what we've seen. In fact, we think Transformers 1 takes place millions of years before Earth even exists. So we are uh, early, early on the timeline for Transformers and earlier than we've ever seen on screen before. The biggest challenge with this film in terms of the look was having metal characters on a metal planet uh, and having characters that reflect everything. So there's light everywhere. There's uh, lens flares that naturally pop up just because that's what the real world lighting would be. So it's been it's been difficult. We have to actually pull back on things and remove what would be naturally uh, created using the camera. So at the beginning of the film, our leads uh, don't have the ability to transform. They're mining bots, which means that they are smaller than everybody else, and they're down in the mines all the time. So they've got a lot of scratches on their paint. They're rusty. Um, they've got dents and damage, and all the little details that are so much fun to design into the character. Then as they get their cogs, they're able to transform for the first time, and so they're almost like, it's almost like they're being reborn. And so their paint is brand new, and the, the fact that their vehicles now is brand new, so they're now uh, they just have this look to them, this, this sheen, and this, the light hits them differently. You can even see like the fleck in the paint and everything. So. It was fun to have this arc for the character as they grew and learned how the world worked. Uh, their, just the visual style of them changed as well. One of the big challenges was what do these characters look like with their vehicles and, and not on Earth? They can't turn into Mack trucks or they can't turn into you know, human trucks or human cars when humans don't even exist yet. So we. Uh, looked at the original design that they would turn into and did a Cybertronian version of that. So it still has a feel of what you know and what you remember watching the original cartoon, but it is uh, on another planet. So this movie takes place before anything we've ever seen in Transformers. It's with uh, Orion Pax, who eventually will become Optimus Prime, and D-16, who eventually will become Megatron. And we're seeing them when they were friends, before they became uh, enemies. and get to see what life was like on Cybertron before it died and, and, and fell apart and before the war on Cybertron. It was fun to create these characters or think of these characters as being their early versions of themselves. And so with Optimus, we've always seen him as being this big, you know, heroic, stoic figure, and he will eventually become that. But 
it was fun to show him a little bit younger, have a little bit more of a younger attitude, a little more um, just shooting from the hip, a little more fun. And Megatron kind of being the opposite, which is he's following the rules and and uh, the two, having the two of them rub against each other was really, really fun to, to play with. With B, we've always seen Bumblebee as, uh, in, the, in the live action films as a silent character, kind of like um, Charlie Chaplin-esque. And uh, we went the opposite direction. He, is, he hasn't lost his voice yet, so uh, we made him extremely talkative and he never stops talking. And the perfect person to pair him up with is, is Alita, who doesn't, ha doesn't um, take any guff from anybody. And so you've got these great pairs uh, of characters that really play off each other well, and then together, both pairs play together as a foursome. One of the things that got me excited about this film was seeing what Cybertron would look like in its heyday. And being that the planet's all metal, I did not want it to just be a big gray ball in the sky. It had to have something more to that, something that we actually cared about. And in order to, because Cybertron basically is what's at stake for this whole film and for probably for all of uh, all of the Transformers lore. They're all trying to get back to Cybertron and, and get back home. And so I wanted to create a Cybertron that was really appealing and had elements of our world in it so that we had something to kind of relate to. So it was fun to think of Cybertron as its own living uh, character. It's a character of itself. There is a lot of comedy in the other Transformers films. Uh, when you have a huge robot going to Earth, you kind of naturally have a fish out of water story and something to, to play off of the fact that a Transformer might not know uh, what other things on Earth are. We didn't have Earth, we just had Cybertron and, and our characters. So we couldn't do the same type of comedy, and we, so we, we really leaned into the, the characters and just their types of characters, what do they know, what do they not know. Uh, there's always a lot of fun with characters just not knowing how things work and, uh, and then just put, pairing them up with other characters that do know how things work and don't want to give the other ones the time of day. So it all came out of the characters, what felt right for the moment in terms of them and not just the situation that they're in. It's Transformers. It needed to have a, a great cast. That, that was kind of, we all knew that right out the, out the gate. And um, a lot of the comedy from Optimus comes from Chris Hemsworth. He is very funny. He uh, riffed a lot of the kind of attitude and looseness of, of Orion Pax. This comes straight from Chris. He, we did a lot of work on that, and he did a lot of work, and, and uh, he would see where the script was going, and then he'd, he'd give me 500 other takes that were in the same vein, but are all great. And, so a lot of the, uh, the coolness and the, the fun of a young Optimus is straight up Chris. First time I read the script, uh, B was talking a lot, and I, which I loved, and I immediately thought of Keegan-Michael Key because I had worked with him before, and uh, I couldn't see it any other way, and thankfully he said yeah. So, and Keegan can say any, any line of dialogue and it's funny. It's just, that's just a fact. I had also worked with Scarlett um, Johansson on another project, and as, we were, as I was reading Alita's lines, I, was, I just saw Scarlett. There was just, it was just her. And uh, it was important that Alita One was not just um, a side character or somebody that leaned into the frame and said something funny. I really wanted her character to affect the story in a major way, and uh, Orion can only become Optimus with her support and with her... Um, with her guidance, and that was uh, something that I talked about with Scarlett, and, sh and she really loved, and, and Chris loved it as well, and it was like, let's make this a, uh, a real group effort. With Megatron, I wanted to have a Megatron that's not just a bad guy the whole time. Obviously, they need to be friends with, with Optimus or with, with Orion, so it was important to get somebody who could play the evil stuff, but then could also go the complete opposite way and play somebody who's extremely likable, somebody you want to hang out around with, you, someone you want to be friends with, and um, all of those is, are Brian Tyree Henry. He is all of that. What does a director do in animation? This is the, the big question. Um, the difference is everybody's seen kind of a live action shoot, meaning you get a camera, you point it at something, and you get a picture of it. Uh, you're pointing a camera at me right now, you get my jacket, you get my shirt, you get my facing glasses. Uh, you get the pores in my skin. 
if we were to do this in in animation, we design all of that, all the way, everything down to the pores, down to the cracks in the ground, down to um, you know the, the style of pants that somebody's wearing. Everything is designed, and everything has to be created. Which means there's a million questions every single day. How how big are the pants? How you know what kind of material are they made of? Is it shiny material? Is it not shiny? Every single thing you see on screen is a question that a director answers. My favorite part of making this movie, as well as any movie, is, is the crew. The, the crew that I get to work with uh, are so talented. They surprise me every single day. And uh, that's the joy of being a director, is being able to see all these little pieces that are being made all in different areas, different areas of the film. And then in my head, I can see how they're all coming together. And then that's um, what's on the screen. So I just, I love working with all these talented people. They're a lot of fun and they're like a second family. I love the score of this movie. Uh, Brian Tyler is a, a genius and uh, he's created something here that it is uh, from another world, which, I, which is what I talked to him about early on. I just said, I want it to feel like it's the coolest music you've ever heard from another planet. And he somehow did that. And I love it. I cannot wait for everybody to hear it. My hope from day one was that this is a Transformers film that has the spirit and um, the feeling of what you had watching the original cartoon as a kid. So really hitting the nostalgia of it, but in a new way that you've never seen before. And uh, telling a story with these characters that makes you laugh, makes you um, fear for them, it's exciting, but also is emotional as well. I'm really hoping that the audience is surprised by the emotion in this film, by the, by the new type of action, by the look of it, by the feeling that they're feeling the nostalgia they had for Transformers when they were younger. My name is Keegan-Michael Key, and I play the character of Bumblebee in Transformers 1. I got involved with the project through the director, Josh Cooley, he came and asked if I wanted to be a part of this project. And I, I gave him a resounding yes, because I am a child, a Transformers child. I was a, a, one of those kids that came home after school and watched the show. And so I was, uh, I was all in. I was all in from his, uh, the first asking. Something that really, that really uh, pleased me about the script was the fact that we were going to, we were, th th I was like, oh, this is what I want. I want an origin story. Because we've, we've, this lore has been going on for such a long time. And we have such a sense of um, who the Autobots are now and who the Decepticons are now. And we know that there is this deep, deep history. And now that we finally get to get a sense of what that history is, I think is super exciting. B-127 is the uh, technical name of the character I play um, who uh, becomes Bumblebee and uh, the character that we've, we've known throughout the years as Bumblebee. And when we first uh, kind of lay eyes on him in the film, he is a guy who works kind of in the dregs. He works like at the, the lowest level, like literally almost the lowest level of um, Cybertron in like the guts and the bowels of the planet. And he just kind of, he works with junk. And, um, but the thing about him that's really appealing, I find, is that he, he has made a world for himself so that it's not, and he also, he also seems to, he has like, not delusions of grandeur, but he always looks on the positive side of things. And I think that he's, he's like, you know, I used to be over here, and then I did this job over here, and I did another job over here. I mean, I just, they like me so much, they just moved me up, and they were actually moving him down. So I think that he decides, this is the world I'm gonna live in, I'm gonna make it as positive as, as I possibly can. And that's and that's what he does. And in fact, he ha he even has four friends that he that live with him in the um, in the um, lower uh, recesses of the city. That, but he but the thing about his f friends is that he made them. He he created them out of parts and junk. And uh, that's who he um, spends his time with. But he he's got this really kind of indomitable spirit. And that's one of the most uh, one of his one of his very kind of charming traits. The cast was one of the reasons I said yes. It was absolutely top notch. And when you think of like uh, a kind of a positive, optimistic, warm, but also an alpha male at the same time, Chris Hemsworth comes to mind. And, and um, there's a gravitas 
that Brian Tyree Henry has that I think it makes him perfect to play Megatron because he also he the the I, I certainly buy the transformation because of that gravitas and the the authority and the speaking of gravitas but the the authority that Lawrence Fishburne brings to Alpha Trion it just settles in perfectly I mean everybody I, Josh thought very carefully clearly about this cast I mean Steve Buscemi there's there's like this kind of unhinged gonzo quality that he brings to his character and everybody everybody brings something that comes from them that's that's part of them naturally to the roles and i think it's fantastic my experience with josh was um was was wonderful absolutely wonderful and there is um we have a he has a very uh, collaborative spirit and i was allowed to ad lib quite a bit and also improvise quite a bit um and it, it really speaks to josh's talent that he can let an actor kind of roam free a little bit but he he has very um, very particular set parameters. But the thing is, the parameters are far enough away from each other that you can roam and, and do things with inside those parameters. And he's very good at, des at describing what the parameters are so that he can really, really tell the story that he wants to tell. And I think that's a gift, and, and Josh possesses it. One main theme is friendship, but also whatever it is that disintegrates a friendship is also a theme. And I guess that could be, maybe another theme is having is having tunnel vision and, and not being able to move from where you are emotionally. And I, I think that that's important. Emotional flexibility seems to be, or the lack thereof seems to be a theme in this movie. Also, um, and this may sound a little hackneyed, but there's, there's teamwork. Like this, this feels like this couldn't have happened without the team. Everybody is integral in the next step of the adventure. And um, so those are, those are some of the themes. And I think also, there's a theme of loss. There's that loss of connection between people who felt very deeply for each other at one point in time, and that um, uh, the tragedy of that of that being of that being broken up. I think it's going to be really great to see this movie in a movie theater. I, really important, I think, because the visuals are sumptuous, and you can't. And, and the other thing is because of the way that this is being this has been created through the effects, you're, do, you're not gonna get visuals like this in a live action movie. It, 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 it is, it's really quite special. And also because it's such an, an action movie, I think that people are going to jump back in their seats and they're gonna make noise and they're gonna, it's, it's gonna be a fun group experience for any audience that, that, um, that you know, goes to the, to the theater to see it. I just hope that people go see it on a big screen so they get the breadth of, of this world of this world, it's a, a world like we've never seen it before. We've never seen Cybertron this way before. We've been talking about the origin story probably after the first movie we began to talk about it because it is such a dynamic story and it is so rare to find a story that is only about character. And a lot of movies try to accomplish that, but it, um, this one, is that uh, and and one of the things and so over the years we kept debating it like all right what are we going to do and Paramount I think rightfully did not want to engage in an animated movie because the live action was going very well but I think uh, Bumblebee's success opened the door to do something different again and this movie is not makeable as a live action film it would be so much money that nobody would make it so you, you had no choice but to do it as animation but the great thing about doing it as animation is it, it gave us a lot of opportunity to do things that only animation could do. I thought Josh's work was really outstanding. And so you could tell that he was a real filmmaker. In meeting Josh, there were several things that came out of that experience that made me convinced. One was he did grow up as a diehard Transformers fan. And I think it really helps to understand the sort of internal DNA that you develop by doing that. Uh, you do have a sense of right and wrong about how a character is portrayed or how the aesthetic of it should feel. But he also talked about our story having a lot of relevance in his life. So I understood that that was really going to help in building both the friendship and the deterioration of the friendship. It's a story of two, I'll say, adults who are not fully matured, um, who go on a search to figure out 
in a way, what's their purpose? You know, what is that is is all is the only thing what they've been told is, you know, you're a minor and this is what you do. And so in, in many ways, it's it's familiar to all of us who have gone through that process where you're kind of confused about where you fit into things. And then you start to get a sense of that. And then you realize the jeopardy of that choice versus that choice. Um, so in this movie, these two they're going through life experiences that are going to fundamentally change who they are. In fact, it all goes all the way to their names change because they're no longer what they were. Uh, and so the journey across the surface of Cybertron and returning to the capital city is one of real eye-opening for the characters and very heroic and very passionate. And so you see a lot of extreme behavior come out of it because it's so absolutely about who who am I how do I fit in Orion Pax and D16 are best of friends so but they have very different outlooks on life uh, D16 would prefer just to follow the road as 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 being told uh, Orion Pax is a dreamer he wants to see the world he believes that there's something better out there for him and for others uh, Bumblebee can't stop talking, and Alita is kind of pissed off at him. So you've got a lot of the different uh, dynamics that those come from those with those kinds of attitudes. So it's a lot of fun, and ultimately it's about are they going to stick together or are they not? What was great about Chris was uh, he's got a pretty deep tenor so it's not hard to imagine that he could be he, you know later on he's you know he's an older optimus prime you can understand where it's coming from uh you know scarlet was she'd worked with josh before and um you know we really wanted to deliver a fully rounded dynamic female character which there aren't that many in the Transformers universe to actually be used. None, none, and they're not the most famous ones. So it was really important for us to find an elevated way to present Alita. We needed somebody like Keegan who's going to be able to deliver the fun of Bumblebee and the sweetness of Bumblebee and the almost... Uh, <laughs> He's got blinders on about who he is. So it just brought a lot of fun, humor, and character out of that. John Hamm turned out to be inspired casting. His performance as Sentinel Prime is just, it's wonderful. It's, it's everything we were hoping it to be. It's funny. It's, it's, he's, seen, he's a guy in command. He is the epitome of uh, the leader you hope to have in a society like this. Steve Buscemi, who we were desperate to get for Starscream, uh, because he has such a great voice. And Starscream in the series was always had this very peculiar, very different, distinctive sounding voice. And the second uh, one of us said, well, who should be Starscream? Somebody said, you know, Steve Buscemi. We're not casting Megatron when we cast Brian. You're casting D-16. So we wanted somebody who, whose voice, and if you look at the breadth of his work, he's done such different tonal things that um, who's in many ways the sort of the emotional resonance of the tone of the character changes the most of any character in the movie. And so you needed a really fine actor who who you know you could see tape on who's done the scary guy, the funny guy, the all that stuff. And so. Um, you know, we hit on that and we thought, oh, okay, that's going to be a really good pairing with Chris because they are very different. And we wanted to have both that very different and yet achieve the sort of friendship that we achieved. I think there's quite a few things that are unique to this film. And then there's some very high bars that were set that, that we met or exceeded, I think. First of all, the, the I'll just say the visual style of it and the execution of it is completely unique, colorful, dynamic. It's an, a look you haven't seen before. So if you're in the industry, you're you're that's something you're going to really pay attention to. From a storytelling point of view, the 
evolution of the characters and this sense of what we were trying to achieve is something that, I, that, that people should pay attention to. You can't get the excellence that's exemplified in this movie without the coordinating elements. And, and you got to give a ton of credit to Josh because the director has his finger so firmly in each of these pies and they're the ones that can unify it the most dynamically. You know, as a producer, you can do some of that work, but the, but the director, he's doing it with the actors and their performance. He's doing it with the animators, not only in their execution of the look, but also in their execution of the performances. So trying to put all that together was a real feat on Josh's part. We had debates in this about are these are these are there are Optimus and Megatron essentially twelve year olds? Are they fifteen year olds? Are they nineteen year olds? Are they twenty two year olds? What's the because it is a coming of age in a sense, and these characters I'd say resonate more to you know in their early twenties, which is another coming of age when you're heading out into the workplace and trying to decide what you stand for. We were able to push the envelope in terms of camera moves in terms of you know the physics of the world and the action dynamics and the way the set pieces you know what could be accomplished we knew we had to do more than we had ever done uh in the live action movies which is hard to do because in that movie we had you know, uh, 10,000 foot long robotic snakes collapsing skyscrapers and things like that. Um, so it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, even though you're in, the, in an animated world. But I felt like in a lot of the action in this movie, like I was actually on a ride, on a roller coaster. I felt like I was in it. My brain telling me, you, you know, like, are you on a ride right now or are you sitting in a theater? And so that was... Um, that was surprising, and it was um, a unique, um, you know, capability of, of the animation. Keegan, Michael Key, we, we knew right away Josh was friends with him. He'd worked with him. He, it was the first person he brought up to cast in the movie for, for B, and that was very easy. And he brought incredible energy, spirit, um, comedy, uh, to a character that had not talked in any of our movies because he's mute. He only speaks through uh, clips from the radio. Um, in, in, we had a little bit of him talking in, in the Bumblebee movie, but for the most part, he was voiceless. So you had to get that voice right. It was incredibly important to get B, who was going, who we had made the choice would be an over-talker because he's never talked before. And so... That was a stroke of genius, and it was it was you know it really played out, and it's it's endlessly funny. Those are the favorite lines in the movie for audiences. We found this balance where Chris, uh, and it was really a, a stroke of genius on his part, found a way because Chris has a booming voice, the deepest voice probably of any we listen to, uh, but he found a way with his humor, with his sense of humor, and tiny little adjustments in intonation where you believe you know that this giant strapping guy in real life was like a 20 something who was trying to find his way brian had this uh sort of wry quality where you know again you could believe his youthfulness uh in the early stages of the movie and you could by his challenging of of the optimism of Orion, um, at the same time, love their relationship together. Just based on the personality of Alita, the attitude, the strength, the self-belief, uh, Scarlet was, you know, always our first choice for, for that. I want this to be the movie where you know, this would be their opportunity to see a Transformers movie, no matter the age, no matter the gender, no matter, um, you know, whether they'd seen any before or not, because it is an origin story. So if you want to know where it all began, this might be the movie that gives them the courage to embark on the rest of the journey. Um, 
after, you know, chronologically after what happens here. Um, you know, laughter, as you say, humor in the movie is a communal, is best, you know, enjoyed com as a co communal experience. And so it should be something that brings people together in that sense. And we tried hard to uh, tell a story that would, you know, inspire um, kids especially to, to want to give something of themselves, make some sort of sacrifice that would benefit, you know, the greater humanity. Uh, I'm Rob Coleman. I'm the creative director of ILM Sydney. Uh, and I initially started off as the first animation supervisor on this show. Uh, but about a year through into the production, I was promoted up to creative director. And at that point, I could no longer be supervising this show um, day by day. So we moved Steve King into the role as animation supervisor, and he's done a fabulous job, along with Kim Moy, who was looking after the Singapore animators. The first thing that, that really attracted me to the project was Josh himself. I knew of his work, so the opportunity to work with such a talented, gifted storyteller, filmmaker, is top of my list. Um, and then I've got a team of animators who grew up with the Transformers, uh, so I knew that that was going to be a very hot property and I'd have uh, animators lined up my door out my door which happened they all wanted to scramble and get onto the show so that's always a good sign that we're gonna have fun on a project the creative director is in, uh, main role is to ensure the ILM quality um, coming out of that studio and we have five studios around the world and we can have multiple projects running concurrently so in the last year we had seven projects uh, and Transformers 1 just being one of them so that's part one of the creative director job. The other part is, along with the director of production, the creative director is the first person who sees any new work coming into the studio and assesses how we could fit that in. An animation supervisor on a show is looking after the performances of the characters. So uh, working very closely with our director, Josh Cooley, to hear about the arc of the characters, who they are, how they're going to perform, um, you know, where they are in their journey, all those things that we talk to the uh, uh, animators, the actors, uh, about the, the work from day to day. The first step along the way is to get your head wrapped around the story. And in this case, it began in November of 2021 when I had my first conversations with Josh Cooley. And he presented the origin story that we see now. Um, and it's about two brothers, you know, two friends who really are you know, great buddies, but through events that happen in their lives, they diverge and end up on very, very different paths because of their worldviews. So the first thing you do as an animation supervisor is to get that story into your head, and then you talk with the director about the various main characters, who they are, what makes them tick on the inside. In animation, we're always talking about the text, well, that's what's written or said by the uh, voice actors, and then the subtext what are they thinking inside their head? How are they feeling about a, any particular scene they're in? Or do they believe in what the other character is saying? In my early discussions with Josh, it was really important that we lean into the subtext. That's why he wanted the faces designed the way they were, that we, the human audience, could watch them, feel them, feel their emotions, and all that becomes layered into the performance that we get out of our team of animators. I was absolutely f familiar with Transformers, and I'd seen the uh, 1980s cartoon. Uh, I'd seen some of the live action films that ILM had worked on, uh, that were a combination of you know, real people and the Transformers. But in um, discussions with Josh, what he had said is he wanted us to take inspiration from the 80s cartoon, or what he called Gen 1, Generation 1 of the Transformers, but then they were redesigned to be fully three-dimensional, uh, and he's very particularly wanted the faces to be readable. So that was part of what Amy Christensen, who designed all the, the Transformers, had in mind when she was doing all that fabulous design work. The reason that the that characters in this movie are so great is because Josh has tapped into the, the, the humanity of each one of them, and then in working with the voice actors, he's, he's crafted just amazing performances, and we animators stand on the shoulders of those two things. In animation, it's, 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 it's easy to do the big, or it's easier to do the big um, action pieces or the very, you know, 
verbal talking pieces. It's another thing to bring um, humanity to the nonverbal, subtle performances. And so um, I knew from my discussions with him, he, that's what he, re he really wanted to make sure the ILM animators could do that. And, and, and boy, this team delivered. The vision for this film, I, you know, I've always kind of thought of it as stylized realism. They're three-dimensional characters. We're on Cybertron, so we're not, we're never on Earth and we're never around human beings. So, like any animated feature, if you define the physics and the movement of the characters, as long as you stay true to that, the audience will happily go along with you. So, this is a beautifully crafted and designed movie. So, Jason from Paramount and Amy from ILM uh, and looking at the environments and the color palettes and the um, materials, put a lot of love into um, you know what the world looked like. And then the animation team comes along and then works on how they move and how they perform and how they act. Um, and it's a, the, making these films are it's a massive team effort. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that work on a movie like this. Josh, you know, in terms of the style of animation, he wanted it to be handcrafted. He wanted it to look what we call keyframe animation. It's not driven by motion capture, meaning Josh never wanted it to look like it was driven by someone in a robot suit. Um, but he always wanted the characters to feel alive, that they were thinking and they were emoting. So it's a very, it's a, it's, it's a human story but done with robots. And we spent a great deal of time in the early development working out the eyes. They're mechanical. They're more like um, camera lenses, like little shutters. And they move, and they've got little doors that open and close that give us more expression in the eyes. That was all done on purpose, because our eyes, our human eyes, are so expressive. And we can tell just by looking at someone's face and how they're feeling. Uh, and that's what Josh wanted on this. Seeing Icon City for the first time, designed by Jason uh, and the, his team, his art team, uh, kind of blown away by this, this, the size and scope and scale and the fact that it's growing up from the ground and it's growing down from the, the upper mantle. So you've got these stalactites and stalagmites, uh, and it's this vast, it's an enormous city. So that was exciting to see. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how many environments we had, but I think there was over 50 environments that we go to in this film. And each one designed beautifully, some of them on the surface and some of them in an Icon City. So that gave a, a, a beautiful palette uh, to the film. And then the design of the characters and the, and the attention to detail that was put into the surfacing. So you can see when you're in the close-ups, you can see scratches and scuffs and paint that's been chipped away because these characters have had a history. Josh is amazing. Uh, I've been working in, in uh, animation and visual effects for 35 years. Josh is a rarity. Um, he is so, he's so collaborative. He's so appreciative. Um, he is so excited to get into the reviews. Um, he's just someone that you want to just lift your game for. He's someone that so clearly is wired about story and about character. Um, so, you know, for those of us who are helping bring the performances and, and bring his vision to the screen, um, you can't ask for a better um, director, filmmaker to be working with. Um, he just has so much passion and so much energy and so much love for the, the, all the, the people that contributed to it that it, he was an absolute joy to work with. I am an enormous fan of Josh Cooley, uh, our director. I absolutely love his brain. I love his work so much. And I knew he was working on the Transformers film. Um, you know, we were like, we've been kind of creatively circling each other for a long time. And it was a complete, total surprise when he wrote to me and asked me to voice Alita. He was like, I've been working on the script. I can only hear your voice playing this character. Um, I, I just, it was, it was, a sh it was a total shock. Um, and so I read the script and it was so great. It was such a great script. I was so happy for Josh. And it just felt like it was, I, was like, I said, of course, I would love to collaborate on this with you. And then I started looking at all the renderings from ILM. I mean, it was just, I, it was so exciting to be a part of something that was completely fresh and an origin story. Um, I got to collaborate obviously with my good friend, Chris Hemsworth. 
Um, and he sort of like pulled me into, he was like, come on, let's do this together. And I think also to make, to be a part of something that felt like an introduction to a new generation too. Um, obviously I grew up surrounded by Transformers, but you know, for my daughter who's 10, she's gonna get to experience Transformers in a whole new way for the first time. Alita is sort of on her own journey um, because when you see her, she's really, she very much believes in, you know, the, um, the process of, you know, like moving up in the ranks. She's almost like, um, I would describe her as a, it's almost like she works for like a big corporation or something like that. She's kind of on this like corporate ladder, like, you know, in a way, um, like, okay, so if I get, you know, if I get this work done, like I'm going to get a promotion and I'm going to get it done on time and I can like, you know, be efficient, I'm going to get a promotion and then I'm going to be like at this ranking. And then like, that's, you know, she's sort of like moving up the ladder and she suddenly has to kind of reevaluate everything that she's thought all of her values are suddenly like turned upside down. Not her values necessarily, but her, everything that she thought was her reality is just completely transformed for lack of a better word. And she is, you know, she's suddenly like staring at a different, like she's looking right at a different, a completely different reality than what she has been living in. And I think she's a character that has a lot of integrity. She's a born leader. She's kind of a type A personality who is a little bit of a control freak, but she's like very efficient and responsible and a little tightly wound. That's how I would describe her. Josh is a very animated person and he also has a great like speaking voice and he hears the musicality of the lines in his in his head, which is what makes him such a great director and writer director. So that's really helpful actually, because he knows kind of what he's, I can, sometimes I would even be like, can I parrot you? Because you have in your mind, like something that is like a specific quality that like I'm trying to, you know, emulate. It's just fun. I love doing voice work. I love the specificity of it. And I love the nuance of it and it's delicate work, which is, which I enjoy. Um, yeah, so it was, it was, was awesome, really, really fun. And I, again, I love working with Josh so much that it's always a pleasure to be with him and hang out and he's, he loves to laugh too. So he laughs a lot during the dialogue, especially because there's a lot of fun comedy in the film and it's his very specific kind of brand of comedy, very dry and, and sort of silly. And so, uh, a little bit like sarcastic humor. They really created something that feels completely unique to this Transformers, and I'm really excited to see that. And yeah, and to hear it too, the, the sound is giant. I mean, when you think of Transformers, you just think of like the soundscape too. Um, so I'm excited for the whole experience. I'm gonna get my big popcorn. <laughs> and I'm gonna just, yeah, I'm inviting my friends and their kids, and I think it's gonna be awesome. I'm, I'm very excited for it. The characters are, I think, represent, like really represent like an organic group of friends and like all of their differences and their humor and, you know, is very much feels like, yeah, a group of like, a group of teenage friends. And so I think because of that, it really appeals to, there's like a nostalgic piece to it. Um, there's a lot of integrity to the story and like the message is really important. And so I think parents would also appreciate that, but it's also just really fun and funny. So I think, you know, for, like my daughter will love it too. Um, like we'll love to see it together because it's just, it's just fun and it's like such a fun experience. It's like you can go with, like your grandparents can take you, you could go with your date. It's just has, it has a lot of different appeal to it. And I think Josh, his humor is, again, so ironic and very much like on that perfect line, like it's for kids, but it's also for adults. Like adults will understand like the greater meaning of stuff in a different kind of way. And it also appeals to kids because it's like right at their level too. Um, it's, that's why I loved the script. I was like, you, you nailed it. You really got it. It's like such a fun read. It like ignites the kid in me, but I also love it as, you know, I'm on.
we wanted to tackle a story that we thought couldn't be tackled in any other way than through animation. Uh, this movie is that story, uh, something that we feel fans have been looking for, something we feel people were excited about, and something we feel showcased like the real personality of our Transformer characters in a way that the live action movies never could. These iconic sort of, you know, pairings uh, enthrall people and, and generally I think people understand that the relationships that create this type of animosity is something that has to be important, emotional, and, and long-standing. Um, and I think that the fact that this rivalry is so well known between Optimus Prime and, and Megatron, yet people don't and haven't really understood the reasons behind it, I think is the thing that has enticed fans and, and maybe just the general public to try to just want to know a little bit more. The perspective of this movie is completely different, right? Almost every live action Transformers movie is from the perspective of a human. And there are reasons for that. Um, but this movie was going to be from the perspective of the f characters that people care about the most, you know, Optimus, Megatron, Bumblebee, and Alita. And, and understanding that, I think, as a core element, was the most important thing for us. In the way that it was approached, this was a character-driven story. We wanted to figure out how we were going to get these characters from their sort of younger selves and starting to glimpse a version of the characters that they know like as quote unquote full grown in that way and watching that evolution unfold over the course of this movie was something that I think was very different from the approach to any of the other films. We meet up with Orion Pax, D16, B127, and Alita 1 as they go off on this sort of haphazard adventure. What we come to realize is Ryan's motivation, you know, is pure in the sense that it's not just to bring Energon back, but it's to bring Energon back to allow him and his friends and the people he knows to sort of be able to choose their own path and be able to choose their own destiny rather than being stuck and sort of in this, in this sort of one, one track version of their life. And I think that alone is something that's really amazing because it's for the first time we see like real human emotion, real human thought process in our Transformers. Like they want what everybody wants, which is, you know, to be able to figure out who they are and make their own life. And I think that's, that's what this story is. As we go off on the rest of their journey, you know, they come to find that things aren't always as they seem. And, you know, by the time we get to the end, you know, our characters have gone through, you know, literal and figurative transformation, you know, to sort of come to be the sort of characters of Optimus and Megatron, uh, Bumblebee and Alita that we know moving forward into the, into the rest of the franchise. Josh is obviously incredible with story. He's incredible with character. He's incredible with his actors. But more than that, I think Josh has an incredible ability to get everyone on board with, with feeling comfortable to share, to collaborate, to feel good, feel like they're being listened to. And then he takes all that in and kind of comes out with his perspective. And and not that that's an amalgamation of everything. Sometimes it's a choice between doing things or not doing things. But I think Josh, first and foremost, is an incredible collaborator. And he's great at bringing and getting the best out of people. And, and I think I, I enjoyed working with him so much on this movie. Um, and I really, really hope I get a chance to work with him again soon. If you were going to go see a spectacle because it feels big and fun and funny and it's something that your entire family can go watch. I can't think of a better movie than this one. It has everything you would want. Great laughs, giant action, beautiful, beautiful look that I think is only enhanced by seeing it on a giant screen. Um, you're going to laugh. Some people might even cry. 
you're going to walk out of it feeling completely pumped like, you know, you've been to a rock concert. And uh, I think that's what people look for when they go to a movie. Um, you know, movies are supposed to make you feel something. And, and I think this one's going to make you feel a lot.